Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Tibor Rutar. He is Assistant Professor of Sociology at the University of Maribor, Slovenia, researcher at the Center for the Study of Post-Socialist Societies in Maribor, and researcher at the Research Center for Strategy and Governance at the University of Ljubljana. His scholarly work is currently focused on political, economic, and historical sociology, particularly long-standing social issues related to democracy and capitalism. And today we're going to focus on his latest book, Capitalism for Realists, Virtues and Vices of the Modern Economy. So, Dr. Ruther, welcome to the show. It's a big pleasure to have you on. Hi, Ricardo. It's so awesome to be here. Thanks for having me. So, uh, sometimes I like to start my interviews with definitions because particularly when it comes to a debate surrounding the vices and virtues of capitalism, many times you see people on both sides of the aisle using definitions that fit their purposes. Uh, I mean, for, for example, people on the left to try to find more vices than virtues and on the right, the opposite. So, uh, how would you define capitalism as an economic system? Yeah, so the, the most basic and abstract level, I think of capitalism as a system that has the following. So that is secure property rights, private ownership of the means of production, and widespread market dependence and widespread market competition. So that means that a society is capitalist if people in it are not afraid that their property is going to get expropriated overnight, if the majority of the productive assets like uh, factories and offices and firms and companies are held in private hands uh, instead of a, a collective body like a state. Uh, then with market dependence, I simply mean that uh, you need to have the, the major uh, economic actors like capitalists and workers need to get involved into market exchange on a daily basis if they are to reproduce themselves in their structural location. So as workers and as capitalists, if they stop going to the market, capitalists stop uh, cease being capitalists. And the same goes for workers who have to constantly resell their uh, labor power. And then lastly, with market competition, I simply mean that ha there has to be loads of buyers and sellers of goods, of services, of labor power. They have to be competing among each other. Um, there, there mustn't be too many monopolies. Uh, the, uh, the entry into market for potential new entrants has to be relatively easy, not too many uh, trade barriers and so on. So if you group all that together, I'd say the society uh, is capitalist. Now, one could also, uh, one could also uh, say here, well, but why choose this definition? Uh, like you said, Ricardo, there are many definitions of capitalism. Uh, some are very minimalistic. Some people say that wherever you have money or markets, uh, you have or the profit motive you also have capitalism which i don't think is uh, quite right uh, but yeah why choose my definition well one issue here is of course the definitions are tautologies they can't be correct or wrong there is no one true definition of, of capitalism or anything else but what i try try to do to manage this problem of arbitrary definitions is i first ask what are the typical economic consequences that most people associate with capitalism and then i try to work backwards and try to stipulate the social institutions and incentives that have to exist in a society so that people behave in such a way that they bring those economic consequences about let me just say a few words on this uh, so the typical economic consequences of capitalism are constant increases in gdp per capita year on year decade on decade maybe even century after century a constant increases in labor productivity, uh, the constant uh, process of cutting costs, trying to be more efficient, innovating technologically, introducing labor saving technology into the production process. The, most, most people agree on that. And then if we ask ourselves, well, what kinds of social structures need to exist in a society for people to behave in such a way? The answer is what I gave you before. Those are the main institutions of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And since I mentioned at the beginning that there are different positions and takes on capitalism and also on the other hand socialism, what do we know about people's current opinions on those two systems? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have some evidence and I go through the data in my book uh, from, coming mainly from the US that uh, may, many people are very critical of capitalism and they are quite appreciative of socialism, especially the youth. Uh, 
young people, especially Gen Zers and millennials, it's something like 60 or 70 percent uh, approve of uh, socialism and are uh, disapproving of capitalism. And then it gets to 50, 50 or uh, 40, 60 for older generations. Uh, so, yeah, most people, even the majority, are critical of uh, capitalism. You can also look at uh, YouTube. You've got um, many YouTube creators, content creators like um, uh, Vosh or Hassan Piker, people that have hundreds of thousands of subscribers, millions of subscribers, tens of thousands of concurrent live viewers. And what they do is they create content on Marxism, Marxist political theory, socialism. They comment on daily news from a socialist perspective or anti-capitalist perspective. And people seem to, to love that kind of content. Also, if you look at organizations, I think I talk in the book about the Democratic Socialists of America. This was a tiny group, a relatively tiny group 10, 15 years ago, like 10,000 members and the most of them older people. The, the average age, I think, was 70, something like that. And then in the past 10 years, with the campaigns of Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn, uh, the, the, the membership has swelled to 100,000 and the average age was brought down to, to 33, something like that. So especially young people, Ricardo, are quite appreciative of socialism, even though we don't know precisely and they don't say themselves quite uh, precisely what they mean by socialism. Usually they don't mean Soviet style uh, centralized planning. They don't mean really existing socialism from the 20th century. What they have in mind mostly is uh, Nordic style uh, social democratic capitalism like Denmark or Sweden, when you have robust capitalist institutions, um, property rights and the free markets and so on, but also a large size of government. So loads of taxation, social transfers, and uh, high levels of government spending and social spending, and some security for workers, centralized bargaining, that is strong trade unions. So they, they want a mix, I would say, of capitalism and socialism that is at the bottom, at its core, more capitalistic than socialistic. So that is one issue with the word, like you said, with the word uh, socialism. Mm -hmm. So, of course, when we think about capitalism and people who oppose it, the biggest theoretical framework out there probably that goes against capitalism is Marxism. But we have... Uh, within economics, what uh, people call analytical Marxism, that is people who are Marxists, follow Marx at least to some extent. It's, it's not, of course, that all of them or even a majority of them follow Marx uh, or Marx's works as gospel. Of course, some of them are critical of some aspects of them uh, and try to also bring a scientific perspective into it, try to test some of his theories and all of that, but uh, what does it get wrong? Analytical Marxism and Marx specifically, what did he get wrong about capitalism and how it works? Yeah, so nice of you to mention the, the paradigm of uh, analytical Marxism. Let me first say a few words on that and then I'll answer your your question. So yeah. analytical Marxism, like you said, is a, a research program that um, emerged in the 1970s, 80s and 90s. You said in economics, definitely in economics, but also outside of economics in political theory and sociology and um, political science. And this, this, uh, this is a uh, body of theory associated with people like Jon Elster and Eric Olin Wright and John Romer, even Herbert Gintis, whom you've had on the show and who unfortunately passed away recently. Um, and yes, like you said, these guys were uh, Marxists, they were radicals, they were socialists, but they were also contemporary social scientists. And they, uh, they tried to do two, two things. First of all, they tried to rework or reframe the central claims and arguments and conclusions of Marx and Marxists after Marx with a modern social scientific outlook in mind uh, by using the tools of analytical philosophy, trying to be precise in their definitions, making clear distinctions, being transparent in how they argued their, their logical chain that they proposed and their causal cha chains that they made. And they used game theory, they used methodological individualism uh, when it came to complex situations where collective uh, interests and individual interests of, let's say, workers diverged. They tried to, um, like Marx didn't do, they tried to uh, tease out what will be more likely. Will workers act in their individual or their collective interest? Whereas Marx simply said that usually they'll work, they, they will act in a, their uh, collective interest. And then they try to empirically test these uh, uh, arguments and conclusions with uh, the use of mathematics and statistics and so on. 
and so on. And like you said, uh, what they found was um, a, a sort of a mixed bag. In, in a word, what they found was that the most analytical, the most actually scientific claims of Marxism turn out not to be specifically Marxist, and the, the most specifically Marxist claims turn out to be not really substantiated on the grounds of modern social science. To give just a few examples, uh, you can argue that workers are exploited, uh, are exploited in capitalism without relying on Marx's labor theory of value. You can do that in, in the standard neoclassical economics framework. So this is a claim that is not distinctively Marxist, yet can be, can be um, defended. On the other hand, you've got various other distinctively Marxist claims, like the idea of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, which ostensibly causes a per periodic capitalist crisis, and at some point will cause the breakdown uh, of capitalism as a system uh, itself. You have certain uh, ideas like the Marxist theory of history, which is propelled through definite stages by the uh, increase in technology. Um, you have the idea of bourgeois revolutions like the French Revolution and the English Revolution. These are more specifically Marxist ideas. And what analytical Marxists found was that they're either theoretically incoherent or hard to defend, or that theoretically they're fine, but empirically they turn out to be wrong. So, so it's a mixed bag what they found. Mm -hmm. So we cannot really say that Marx was completely wrong, but he was wrong in many ways. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Definitely not completely wrong. Wrong in in his most um, his most distinctive contributions. So in in the ideas that he had that can't be made within any other theoretical perspective. Like in sociology, you have Marxism as a big uh, theoretical paradigm and Weberianism, that is the theory of Max Weber. And um, most of what Marx says, which is correct can be made uh, on the basis of Weberianism. And uh, the, the distinctive thesis, well, now that is something that usually turns out, not always, but usually turns out to be uh, wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell us then about the approach you use in your book, because of course you do not come, I, I think, or apparently from neither a Marxist nor what would be the complete opposite, a libertarian perspective, but where do you come from and how do you approach the topic of capitalism and its effects on society in your book? Yeah, I'm in a funny position because uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, as I was finishing my undergraduate studies, I fell in love with Marxism more the analytical Marxist flavor, uh, but, but uh, anyway, I was a Marxist and I wrote my master's thesis and my PhD uh, from a Marxist perspective, trying to um, do something similar that analytical Marxists did in the uh, areas that uh, they didn't touch that much, and also trying to, um, uh, trying to defend Marxism uh, b uh, against various critiques coming from postmodernists and from Weberians. Uh, so I have a deep uh, knowledge, I would say I have a deep knowledge of Marxism, especially Marxist economics and Marxist historical sociology. Uh, but on the other hand, in the past, uh, say, five years, I also started um, studying neoclassical economics, institutional economics, more mainstream approaches, even uh, some theories that are associated with libertarianism, like public choice economics or public choice theory. And now that I've um, delved into both of these bodies of uh, literature, of theory, I, I am kind of torn. I see some valuable insights in analytical Marxism. I see some valuable insights in institutional economics, in public choice theory. So I try to merge, I try to synthesize these approaches in my book. And I also try to be as empirically minded as possible. You know, Ricardo, then when you read books about capitalism, usually there are these big picture, uh, top down kind of approaches where you lay out your grand theory of social phenomena or grand moral normative philosophy. And then you try to uh, defend everything through that prism, not, not paying that much attention to empirical data. Uh, and I, I try to um, take the reverse approach, be us. Um, as thin as possible with my theory, just use the, the common assumptions of uh, rational choice theory that people, political actors, economic actors, workers, capitalists, uh, trade unionists, everybody are, is smart, tries to do the best they can for themselves and their family, tries to strategize and uh, is responsive to incentives. I just try to use that kind of neutral approach, theoretical approach, and then I try to leave um, empirical data to tell the story 
so, so that's why I come to sort of mixed conclusions in my book, Virtues and Vices, and I don't, I don't think I overemphasize either side of that, uh, of that debate. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would like to ask you now about the historic origins of capitalism and several different explanations, the most prominent ones at least that are, that are out there. So, uh, starting with cultural explanations for the European transition from feudalism <laughs> to capitalism, of course we have Weber's, Henrik's, and uh, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, Mockers. Yeah. So, uh, what, what do you think about each of them? Uh, do you think that they get some aspects right and what do they get mm -hmm. wrong about it in your opinion? I do think they get some aspects right and they're definitely all interesting explanations. So Max Weber's explanation, as you probably recall, uh, simply says that the emergence of Protestant values after the Reformation in the, uh, at the end of the medieval uh, period was the main cause of capitalism, not the only one, but the main differentia specifica, so the, the main uh, cause um, that really uh, separated out uh, some economies from others. Uh, Weber said that uh, people traded and exchanged goods for millennia, but now they did so after the emergence of Protestantism in a peculiar way. Because Protestant values emphasize ascetism, uh, trying to reinvest your surpluses, not splurging them on luxury consumption, uh, trying to um, be as hardworking as possible, Weber thought that these new values induced people to act in a more capitalistic way when they are trading. So they traded before, but now they will, be, they will start trading in a specifically productive capitalist way. Um, uh, Joe Henrik said that uh, something similar but not specifically uh, focused on Protestantism. Uh, he said that from uh, uh, the 5th century AD up till the 1500s, there were some significant normative changes uh, that the church, not the, the Protestant church, but the church in general, um, the, the Catholic church, um, uh, ignited. Uh, and by doing that, it unintendedly caused the, the, the transition to democracy, to capitalism, to modernity in Europe. Uh, the, the story is quite long and complex. Complex, but in a few words, what he said is simply that they banned um, uh, uh, polygyny, they tried to enforce uh, monogamous marriage, they banned um, uh, um, marrying your cousins, and they uh, enforced the neo-locality, which means that young couples have to move away in a different village from their parents. And uh, through a very complex process, this basically created the social context where strangers started meeting and cooperating, and that for um, Henrik induced very, various correlates of uh, modernity like individualism and capitalism and so on. And then Joel Mokir that you mentioned simply says that the emergence of enlightenment values and the enlightenment ideas in the 17th century, the 18th century, was what caused uh, Western Europe to diverge from the rest and so to, to a step um, on the path of modernity and the industrial revolution. Now what I think might be missing from these accounts or what I think they get wrong is the following. So um, all of them, Weber, Henrik and Mokir, have a, a thesis that applies to the whole of Western Europe or most parts of Western Europe. But what I show in my book is that actually only one part of Western Europe, namely England, was really special uh, when it comes to economics or uh, uh, the economy. After uh, the 15th and 16th century, only England between 1500 and 1880 really moved to a self-sustaining um, capitalist type of economic growth where GDP per capita is constantly increasing uh, and you're no longer trapped in a Malthusian cycle where labor productivity is constantly increasing. This didn't happen in Italy, this didn't happen in France, this didn't happen in Sweden, in Austria, in Switzerland, in Germany. So these pan-Western European theses, I think are, are, they're kind of missing the, 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 the uniqueness of England. Mm -hmm. So uh, taking into account what these explanations lack, what would be an alternative explanation then? Yeah, yeah, I would be more focused uh, more than on cultural phenomena or ideas. I would be focused on what happened with uh, power relations, especially in England, because it was special power relations at the end of the Middle Ages. What happened with the um, arrangement of property in England? Because I think here we will find answers to my uh, initial answer uh, to your question about the definition of capitalism. That is, how you get, how do you get, uh, how do you uh, come from a society full 
full of uh, peasants, small peasants living on their land, to a society where om almost everybody is a worker who, can't, who doesn't have anything to reproduce himself, but has to sell their labor power in the market. So what I would say is the following. Um, in the aftermath of the um, Black Death, of, of the plague pandemic that you know killed one third to one half of the whole of Europe, and yeah. this applied also to England. So in the early 15th century, late 14th, early 15th century, there were significant changes of foot uh, on the countryside in England. Uh, specifically, uh, peasants uh, increased their bar bargaining power. They become, be became more powerful vis-a-vis uh, -vis the landlords because they now became a precious commodity. Uh, many of them died off. L landlords were dependent on them, on their exploitation for their uh, surplus. So now uh, peasants became more powerful and they decided to try to throw off the feudal yoke uh, of the institution of serfdom. Inst the institution of serfdom was basically uh, something like being a slave, you were bound to your lord, you were bound to the land, your mobility was highly restricted. So naturally peasants would fight against that. And they, they managed, they succeeded in their fight against that in the mid 15th century or the early 15th century, serfdom was abolished. And now Ricardo, uh, landlords in England were faced with a double revenue crisis. First of all, because so many peasants died off because of the pandemic. And then secondly, because the remaining peasants became free and free peasants are hard to exploit. So they now had two options, the English landlords did, uh, how to react to this revenue crisis. The first option was what their counterparts in uh, France did. In France, when something similar happened, uh, landlords simply turned to the state. They built up or joined the tax office absolutist state, which could exploit free peasants through the institution of taxation. This was hard to do in England for reasons we don't have to go uh, into right now, but this was not really on the table in England. Absolutism was not on the table uh, in England. So there was only the second option that the landlords had. And the second option was they could um, rent out, they could lease their private land, the, the landlords that they had. And this was, we are talking here about one third of the best land in England, hundreds and hundreds of acres of land per individual landlord. They were in a much better position in this respect than the French uh, landlords were. Uh, they, they saw this land in England and they thought to themselves, well, now that this land is simply laying on work, no, pe no peasants, no serfs are working the land, what if we don't get any surplus from it? What if we economically rented it out to wealthier peasants called yeomen? Um, they would probably take on uh, our lease and maybe we could get a, a rent in return. And they did so, they instituted temporary contracts that would um, run out in a few years, maybe a decade. And now the wealthier peasants, Ricardo, had a very different incentive than before. Wealthier peasants before this transference of uh, land uh, only worked uh, 20 or 30 acres, which is something, but you can do that with your own family labor. You don't really have an incentive to specialize in the production of one single crop, uh, let's say grain, try to produce as much as possible and efficiently as possible and then uh, sell that um, produce on the market. You don't have such an incentive with 20 acres of land. But now that these yeomen, these wealthier peasants got 100, 200, 300 acres overnight, suddenly it, make, it made sense for them to specialize. And this is one way, Ricardo, in which they became dependent on the market. Because now they used all of their land to just produce for the market everything they can. And then with the money they get back, they would try to buy for themselves uh, food and clothes. So, so various uh, stuffs that they produce for themselves back then before the transference uh, on, their, on their land. So uh, this and a few other things, like um, there was competition between landlords, they tried to get rid of this land as soon as possible, so they offered good deals to the peasants. This started unintendedly creating market dependence, market competition on the market for land, on the market for agricultural products, and these were the first steps uh, to, towards agricultural capitalism in England. There was one more, I should mention, one more um, process that was important because uh, by, by mentioning what I just did, we can explain the first, the appearance of first two legs of the triad, the, the typical capitalist triad, uh, that is the um, uh, capitalist landlord and the capitalist tenant farmer, but we haven't explained the last one, that is the landless laborer, the wage laborer. And this starts emerging uh, in the uh, aftermath, that is the 16th and the 17th century, when the wealthier peasants and landlords now working together, uh, try to expropriate small peasants. 
uh, true legal and illegal evictions, they throw the small peasants uh, off the land and privatize it. And they also take ownership of the commons. So um, various pastures and woodlands and lakes that were held in common ownership before, um, these actors now put a fence around that and privatize that land. So by doing that, now you start seeing a creation of a large class of landless laborers that could do what? Well, they could be employed on those large farms of hundreds of acres because those farms can no longer be worked by the family labor of the wealthier peasants. So now you really start seeing uh, the emergence of capitalist structures. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, this is not a topic that you touch on directly in the book, but I think it's important just to ask you one brief question about it. Of course, we have all of these sorts of explanations, Enrich's, Weber's, Mockers, yours, Marx's, and uh, other libertarian uh, and more capitalist-oriented explanations or ex explanations that uh, favor more or put uh, capitalism under a better light, let's say. But... I mean, there's also sometimes people who come up with, uh, and this might be dangerous in many ways, uh, explanations that have to do with some sort of European culture superiority and that are at least to some extent racist sometimes. But I mean, those are not at all uh, supported. Right. I mean, if you if you if you're going to have a good explanation for why starting in England uh, capitalism developed, I mean, you can include cultural factors, social factors, possibly even ideological factors and material factors and all of that. But certainly an explanation along those more uh, cultural superiority slash racist lines is not good at all. Right. Yeah, you're spot on. You're spot on. I don't think it is. And this is not just my um, former Marxist pedigree talking here or my, my political correctness. Um, I, I mean, I would even separate out, this might be controversial, but I would separate out two parts of your question. I would say, first of all, let's ask what were the actual empirically supported causes of the transition. And then secondly, if they would turn out to be something that racists spouted, well, okay, so much the worse for us, but maybe these causes are simply correct, even though they are racist, like you said. But uh, as it turns out, I agree with you, the, the various proto-racist essentialist causes are not uh, actually supported. We cannot talk about a pan-European culture or the genius of European mind or the inventiveness of Europeans. No, no, simply the, the phenomenon of the reverse, reverser of fortunes or the fact that England was a backwater in, in the Middle Ages was one of the least developed um, European societies and also, of course, on world scale in comparison to China, England was nothing. And then, at least according to my story, England becomes a preeminent capitalist power. Well, obviously nothing changed in a century that would make uh, Europeans or Englishmen specifically from um, peoples that are not very uh, industrious and uh, are not very inventing to suddenly becoming geniuses. So I com completely agree with you. Those explanations don't hold water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had to touch on that topic for obvious reasons, because yeah. unfortunately we have a lot of that kind of, of talking points nowadays, so it's important mm -hmm. to address it. So yeah. now getting into specifically aspects of how the economic system works, so talking about uh, ac accusations of exploitation and the minimum wage. So mm -hmm. is there evidence that the market, the capitalist market specifically, engenders exploitation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me first take exploitation and then we'll come to the minimum wage because it's related, like you suggested. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let's maybe now take a step back, first of all, and define exploitation. I would say that exploitation in broad terms involves two uh, characteristics. First of all, this is a process of unequal exchange between at least two parties. Somebody has to give you something and then you give them something back in return, but this is not commensurate. Uh, the, the, the exchange is not reciprocal. So in the case of wage workers and employers, wage workers give employers uh, a, a part of the profit and then what they give back, the employers give back in the form of a wage is lower than that amount. That would be exploitation. And the second characteristic is that um, this has to happen because one of the parties in this exchange has to be in a vulnerable position. 
So the worker is exploited, not just because he completely voluntarily decided to engage in non-reciprocal exchange, but because his outside options are not as good. And so in, in a way, uh, this is again not my Marxism speaking here, but in a way he's structurally not forced, but structurally induced to do something he otherwise probably wouldn't do. Even though exploitation is usually mutually beneficial. I should also say that, Ricardo, exploitation is not a zero-sum game. Usually it is true, like libertarians say, that workers offer themselves up for exploitation because they know they'll benefit from that. The problem is that the benefit they get is not high enough. It's unfair in some way. So that's, that's why we call it exploitation. Now for the explanation, or you said, does the market and gender exploitation? Well, um, the Econ 101 perfect competition model would say no, because you have uh, infinite amount of uh, sellers and buyers of labor power. Employers are competing among each other for employees. Uh, everybody is perfectly informed and rational. Employees know all of their outside options, uh, so they could quickly switch a job if they were uh, um, exploited. And in a way, um, what happens is that um, when somebody would be in such a such conditions of perfect perfect competition, if somebody were to be exploited, say that one worker gives an employer uh, five dollars worth of value per hour, this is what's called a marginal product in economics, and only gets one dollar in return in the form of a wage uh, on a per hour basis, this would be exploitation that amounts to four dollars an hour, five minus one. Now, if this were to happen in perfectly competitive conditions, you would have another employer that would see this as a profit opportunity. The, the second employer would offer a, a wage that is $2 per hour for the worker so that he could lure him away from the first employer and he could still profit. The second employer could still profit by utilizing that worker because five minus two is three. So he would get a $3 worth of surplus. And then the third employer would also do that and he would offer $3 an hour. And you can see how in perfect competitive conditions, you would basically at the end of this process get a, a bidding war that would result in wages roughly corresponding with the value that the worker brings to the firm. Now, I don't think that actually happens in the real world. And uh, it, it's, it's so simply because the real world markets are not perfectly competitive. They're more akin to what's called monopsonistic competition or oligopsony, where there is a, a certain degree of market power that employers have over and above of the workers. And so maybe in some markets, there are not many competitors, not many buyers of labor power. Or maybe there are many competitors, but workers simply are not informed about their outside options. Or maybe it's costly for them to search other employer for other employers who would maybe give them a higher wage. So they stick to one um, firm where they're uh, underutilized or they are exploited, and this would not be resolved as in the uh, fairy tale that's uh, usually told from a um, uh, perfectly competitive standpoint. So in that sense, I do think they're exploited. Now for the minimum wage, you mentioned the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. One of one sources of, we were just talking about theory now, comparing the monopsonistic competition model with the perfectly competitive model. But yeah. empirically, we know from the research on the minimum wage and its effects on unemployment, we know that exploitation is probably happening. Why? Well, uh, if markets worked like the perfectly competitive uh, model says that they work, then any amount or almost any amount of minimum wage and especially increases in minimum wage, the, the minimum wage laws that we have right now would probably result in significant disemployment effects. That means that some workers would stay employed uh, and would get a higher wage because of the law, but other workers would get completely let go. They would lose their whole jobs. Uh, this is easy to show with a simple diagram of supply and demand because um, the minimum wage law is a price cap. It's, it's a form of price control. And if it, if it gets above the value of the worker for the firm, if it exceeds the marginal product of the worker, then it doesn't uh, it isn't beneficial for employers to keep hiring or, or to keep uh, these workers on their payroll. Now, what we see from empirical research is that um, on average, minimum wage laws and even increases in minimum wage up till 60% of the median wage in a country don't have disemployment effects or have very minuscule, very small disemployment effects. And this could be only rationalized, theoretically rationalized by not relying on the perfect competitive model, but on the oligopsony or the monopsonistic competition models, which all imply a certain degree of exploitation.
Uh, and even in some circumstances, the research shows that minimum wages can boost employment. Not only they, do, they don't uh, reduce it, they can boost it. And again, how could they boost it? Well, the answer is monopsonistic competition or oligopsony, market power, which means the, there is a divergence between the marginal product, the value of the worker in the typical market, and the wage he gets uh, in return. I should also say that uh, direct measures of market power, direct measures of the amount of exploitation on existing markets, uh, say that uh, there is uh, exploitation, uh, the exploitation rate of about 15 to 20 percent. So workers, this is data from the United States, workers are usually, their wages are usually 15 to 20 percent lower than they would have been in a perfectly competitive, no exploitation uh, situation. Mm -hmm. So I think this makes a good segue into uh, the question surrounding poverty, because of course there's also a big debate between different people about the relationship between capitalism <laughs> and poverty. There are people out there that claim that capitalism actually increases poverty, or if it doesn't increase it, at least it keeps um, uh, many more people than it could in poverty or below the poverty line. Uh, and we have, for example, the anthropologist Jason Hickel uh, claiming something more or less along those lines. And on the other hand, we have people uh, that present many different kinds of graphs showing mm -hmm. that uh, as countries around the globe adopted a capitalist system, uh, poverty uh, went down a lot. Uh, and that's, th those are claims made by people like Max Roser, for example. So uh, what is the truth, really? Yeah. yeah um, after, after the Davos meeting in 2019, I think you're referring to that episode, uh, there was a, a series of tweets from, I think, Bill Gates and Max Roser and Steven Pinker, uh, which uh, showed the various graphs of our world in data that mm -hmm. showed the reduction in extreme poverty, that, that showed the reduction in uh, childhood mortality and all other good things. And uh, Jason Hickel responded to that uh, with a, a piece, uh, with a paper in um, a Guardian, a title something like, but he didn't choose the title, uh, something like um, uh, Steven Pinker and Bill Gates couldn't be more wrong about the reduction of poverty in capitalism. And what um, Hickel says in that and other publications is something along the following lines. Um, like you said, first of all, he says that basically the uh, extreme poverty reductions that um, we know about are all dated in the past 40 years uh, and not before that. I, of course, the data exists and Pinker and others have tweeted it out. Data exists for various centuries before that, at least uh, from the early 19th century onwards. But Hickel says that we can't rely on that data because the data is not direct. It's not direct consumption household-based surveys, but it's basically a re historical reconstruction of extreme poverty um, rates on the basis of the reconstructed GDP figures for those um, centuries or those decades. And Hickel says none of that makes any sense. Uh, if you just take a look at the GDP data, Hickel says um, um, in the early 19th century, almost no country was capitalist. And so the majority of production uh, occurred outside the market and GDP only measures what happens on the market. So we uh, kind of overstate how, um, uh, uh, how poor people were back then because we don't uh, pay any attention to how much they actually produce produced outside the market on their own farms and on the commonly hand lands and so on. Uh, he also says, Hickel also says that um, you mustn't look at the $2 a day standard uh, international poverty, extreme poverty line. You should look at $3, $5, $7 or $10 a day because the $2, that's just too, too little. If somebody is living on one and a half dollars a day and then moves to two and a half, Hickel says that doesn't mean anything. Why would we celebrate uh, such a move? And then he also says that in the past 40 years, when he uh, recognizes the fall, the, the fall in extreme poverty rates. He says that this is basically mostly on account of China, and China is not a typical capitalist society. He even says that it maybe not be, uh, it isn't capitalist at all. Uh, and now my response to all of that would be something al along the following: <clears throat> first of all, GDP reconstructions are a very, uh, of course, they are just reconstructions, but they are very careful. And they definitely take into account the non-market production that happened in the early 19th century. Uh, historians look at um, uh, cereal yields, uh, grain yields, uh, crop yields in general. They look at how many um, uh, cows and other livestock uh, 
uh, various peasants possessed, they look at the amount of pasture land, of arable land, and they try to estimate based on that what the GDP of a country was, even though not, none of that was um, uh, mediated by the market. And so if you can construct, as various historians do, poverty rates on the basis of those GDP figures, you can come to a, of course, to a certain extent unreliable, but you can come to a good guess about what the extent of poverty was back then. And the extent of poverty was quite high. You, have in, you, you now have even new reconstructions, even new ways of calculating that by the historian uh, Mikhail Moetsos. He did, uh, he did for a certain OECD publication, and he shows that the old figures are basically in line with his new calculations. So I would, try, I, I would trust those uh, data. And here, Hickel is simply mistaken. And then when it comes to the various uh, poverty thresholds in China, I would simply say that, of course, we should look at three, four, five, seven, ten dollars a day, and I do so in the book, and all of them show a decline, a steady decline in past, uh, the past four decades, and now even we have this data uh, with higher uh, thresholds of poverty. We have it for 19th century, we have it for the early 20th century, and uh, all of them are in line with what we know about extreme poverty. So this is, uh, there is no question about two dollars a day being somehow unsatisfactory uh, or not in line with other data. Also, when it comes to China, I mean, of course, yes, very much of the reduction of extreme poverty happened on account of China, but China is one sixth, one fifth of the world population. Uh, and also, I show in the book that it's not true that only China was responsible for the reduction. Every, almost every single but one uh, region in the world saw a reduction in extreme poverty and other thresholds of poverty in the past 40 years. Uh, with, uh, with the most reliable data. And when it comes to China itself, um, of course, I would say that the biggest, the biggest decrease in poverty happened when China moved to a sort of capitalist society, when it started introducing free market-like or liberal liberalizing-like reforms in the aftermath of the death of Mao Zedong mm -hmm. in the 80s and 90s. Uh, China uh, went um, uh, moved to a market-based system. It liberalized, it uh, reduced tariffs, uh, and that coincided with the reduction of extreme poverty. I would say that there is something to the claim that capi the, the capitalistic aspects of China were in part alongside with the state, of course, with the government, were responsible for, for this uh, change. But that's about poverty. But what about inequality? Because it's, it's a different issue. And uh, many people claim that it's on the rise. And I mean, as far as I'm aware, at least there's good data to back that claim. So uh, what do you think about it? Yeah, I, I would Overall, I would agree with that, although it's also complicated here. So first of all, we have to distinguish between income inequality and wealth inequality. Sometimes okay. people group these together and mm -hmm. the trends don't always go in the same direction. As you probably know, income inequality are simply the differences between people of a country, let's say, in how much they earn. Uh, their, their uh, payroll and other earnings, while wealth inequality are the differences between people in terms of total wealth that they possess, the, the value of their house and the car and stocks and, and so on. Uh, and then you also have to distinguish three various measures or dimensions of both income and wealth inequality. So you have within country inequality, between country inequality and global inequality. Within country inequality, simply like we said, the differences between people of a single country then between country inequality are the average differences in income and wealth between, let's say, Slovenia and Portugal. And then uh, global inequality is if you pretend that everybody living on the planet is uh, a citizen of one country, that there are no uh, na nationally, na nationally dividing lines, and you um, arrange them on a distribution scale and look what the differences in income and wealth are between all the global citizens of the world. And Ricardo, what we see is that if we, if we first look at income inequality within countries, let's say in the developed world between the early 1980s and late 1990s, like you said, we see a substantial increase. I wouldn't say an extreme increase, but definitely a substantial increase from the low levels that, were, that we were witnessing in the late 1970s. However, at the same time, after the early 2000s in the OECD countries in the developed world, you actually see a stagnation. Uh, on average, a stagnation inequality, no further increase in the past 15, 17 years. In Latin America, 
uh, in the past 20 years, you've seen a reduction in within country income inequality. Uh, in other countries, there has been an increase, but um, the, the, like I said, the topic is uh, complicated. Now, if we focus on global inequality, both wealth and income, and uh, between country inequality, that has actually been decreasing steadily now for at least two to three decades. Uh, there was an in, uh, there was uh, the high level in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s of the previous century, and then from from then on, basically we've seen a quite notable reduction in global income and uh, between country income inequality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the level we analyze it, and exactly. it's it's a mixed bag. In general. it's a mixed bag. It's a mixed bag. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what drives inequality? Really, if inequality goes up, why is it? Why does it happen? Yeah, at the most abstract level, I'd say that we can blame capitalism, like Marx probably would. Uh, so we can say that uh, simply the fact that when you have relatively free markets where forces of supply and demand are dominant, well, there, in such a situation, you'll see many people that have various different skills, partly due to biological reasons, partly due to social reasons, uh, have many different talents, many different skills. And because some skills will be in high demand, like programming skills, everybody wants to hire a programmer nowadays, and some skills will be in high demand, but their supply will be relatively low, let's say, because only a few people can do that right now. Um, and other skills like um, sweeping the street or um, uh, washing a car, everybody, almost everybody can do that. And the demand for those skills is not all that high because everybody uh, is already doing that, let's say. Then you'll have a mismatch in supply and demand and some people will have high wages and some people will have low wages simply because of the interaction of the forces of supply and demand. So in that sense, I think capitalism could be uh, to blame for rising inequalities. You also have to then bring into the analysis the fact that in capitalism we have secure property rights, we have private ownership of the means of production, we have um, inheritance, uh, in, uh, well, we have inheritance taxes, but we also have inheritance laws which um, make sure that uh, wealthy people can pass on most of their wealth to the next generation, which then can start with a huge advantage, with a huge privilege, and even compound, build upon that wealth. So in that sense, both, both incomes and wealth will probably start diverging or uh, inequalities will start emerging in terms of wealth and, and income in a capitalist society. Uh, those can be kept in check by various government policies like progressive taxation. I already mentioned um, uh, inheritance tax, but also simply progressive taxation. The fact is, as you probably know, and this even holds for the United States, not just Europe, that um, wealthy people pay much more in taxes, both in absolute and relative terms as a percentage, much more in taxes. And in that sense, you can tone down inequalities, uh, which are otherwise spontaneously in capitalism, uh, they tend to increase. We even see that in the United States, if you look at the Gini coefficient, this is one measure of inequality on a scale from zero to 100, where 100 is total inequality and zero is total equality. Uh, the US right now stands at around 40, a Gini of 40. In Europe, it's usually around 31, 32. And um, if you look at the Gini inequality for the United States before and after taxes, there is a 20% difference. So um, um, inequality is reduced by one fifth if you include social transfers and taxes. Mm -hmm. And uh, before we move on to another topic, I think there's one more question about inequality that is very important to address here. So what are its consequences? If we have high inequality, does it have social, political, economic, and other kinds of consequences? That's a very good question because sometimes people get confused about that as well. So at, uh, on one level, Inequality seems a, a, a phenomenon to be a phenomenon that we should not be too much too worried about. Um, the economist, uh, the economist Didier McCloskey, had a critique of Thomas Piketty, the author of *The Capital in the mm -hmm. 21st Century*, the, the guy that we all associate with inequality research, and she was very scathing in her critique. And she said that um, Piketty, when he's worrying about inequality, he's just worrying about a vague sense of envy. Uh, people uh, should be worried about inequality, she says, if they are envious, if they are jealous. But because when inequalities are increasing, she says, um, the living standards of everybody tend to increase. Uh, 
there is nothing much to inequality aside from envy, being envious. Uh, she says that the slogan, the, the usual activist slogan uh, that, um, that says the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer is not actually correct. And she's, and she's right, she's right, this is not correct. Uh, when inequalities are increasing nowadays, you see the rich, uh, they're getting richer and the poor are also getting richer. Just the rate of growth for the poor is much slower than the rate uh, of growth for the rich people. So that's why you see a divergence. You see inequality without anybody's living standards actually decreasing. So do I agree with uh, Deidre McCloskey that inequality then, as long as living standards are increasing, is nothing to worry about? I actually don't, as you uh, intimated with your question. And I don't for various reasons. First up are theoretical reasons. Uh, I can imagine, not from a Marxist perspective, but from a basic economic rational choice perspective, that if income and wealth inequalities are increasing, that means that some actors in a society, economic actors, usually capitalists, will um, have much more resources, monetary and other resources, in comparison to the rest of society, and they can then use that as a leverage when trying to influence po political power, when trying to influence democratic decision-making, regulations, so they can engage in rent-seeking more easily. They can then make deals, nefarious deals, about which public choice theory is warning us, we, usually the, the theory that um, libertarians like. Uh, so uh, they can uh, influence politicians, make advantageous deals with them, and then uh, these advantageous deals between capitalists and politicians will screw over the public interest. So in that sense, inequality theoretically worries me. And then on the empirical side, I go in the book through many studies that uh, try to find what are the correlates, the social correlates of um, increased inequality and high levels of inequality. And what we see is that usually uh, income inequality and wealth inequality tends to be associated with a reduction of social trust, with an increase in homicide rates, and with certain health uh, issues like obesity. Um, there are many claims made in this regard. There was a famous book called The Spirit Level, uh, Wilkinson and Pickett, I think, wrote it in 2010, and they overstated their case. They, they enumerated like something like uh, 20 social problems and said basically all of them are related to inequality, and um, they speculated that probably the link is causal. Now, we have to be careful here. Income inequality doesn't seem to be related to um, teenage pregnancies, to drug use, and so on. Um, but we definitely do see some uh, correlations which are uh, which we could say are morally negative. So if there is a positive association between increased income inequality and the reduction of um, uh, social trust, that, that's uh, from my more normative perspective, that's negative. And uh, some evidence even suggests that it might be causal. For trust and for homicides, the correlation might be causal. And I would, I would worry greatly uh, about that if that turns out to be true. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would like to ask you now about the term neoliberalism because mm. there's a huge discussion about it there are people that say that it's just meaningless there are people that say that it's <clears throat> very much a true thing and we should very much pay attention to it and they associate it of course with people like Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher and others like that so what do you think about it do you what for you what does it mean exactly and is it useful from the perspective of scientific economics? Yeah, that's a good question. When activists use it, and predominantly left-wing activists are the ones who use it, usually it's kind of meaningless and vague. Usually, like you said, they just uh, they use it to describe something that they don't like, something that has to do with economics, or maybe not even that. They enumerate a few problems like um, mental health issues or the rise in suicidality and an opioid crisis or the rise of individualism and consumerism. And they simply say, that is neoliberalism and I hate it. Or they say, that all, all of those things that I hate are associated with neoliberalism, which I won't define, but um, it's something bad. And, and that I don't think is productive for scholarly purposes. But uh, scholars tend to be more careful with it. Not all of them, definitely not all of them. I think in um, David Harvey's uh, famous book, The uh, Brief History of Neoliberalism, and um, uh, Naomi Klein's book, The Shock Doctrine, they don't even define it there. They just vaguely associate it with deregulation and privatization and so on. But some scholars do are, are careful to, to define it um, more precisely, and when they do so, they use it in four uh, different ways, uh, but which are all related. First of all, 
they think that neoliberalism are various uh, discrete attempts at economic reform that have to do with deregulation or privatization or, or something like that. So when a political actor uh, Nash, um, privatizes a formerly um, uh, a firm that was formerly held in a national ownership, or if they reduce tariffs, if they liberalize trade, um, if they do something like that, they would say that this is doing neoliberalism. Uh, then the second definition would basically stretch that one, the first one, and would say that no, neoliberalism are not simply discrete attempts at reform. Neoliberalism is a whole economic system. It's a type of capitalism. Which type? Well, the type that it's characterized by the following. High degree of privatization, high degree of deregulated economy, uh, a small uh, size of government, so low taxation, low amounts of social transfers, uh, low amounts of um, government spending, and um, a, a overall a, a more free market economy. That would be one meaning of the term neoliberalism. And then the third definition is usually that neoliberalism is a form of economic theory, like the Chicago School of Economics associated with Milton Friedman and George Stigler, or the Austrian School of Economics associated with uh, Friedrich Hayek and uh, Ludwig von Mises. They would say these economic theories that are adjacent to neoclassical mainstream economics are neoliberal because they are so fond of the free market, let's say. I think that is kind of problematic because even uh, Chicagoans and Austrians have some huge disagreements among them. They're all free marketeers, but there are some uh, huge disagreements that I go into my uh, book. Um, so I would be skeptical of that definition. And then lastly, the last definition is that neoliberalism is a uh, worldview, an, an outlook, an ideology not just an economic theory, an ideology that says that every social problem or most social problems can best be addressed by free market principles, by the price mechanism, by the introduction of trade and exchange and money and so on. So that, that would be the last definition of neoliberalism. We could also, but, but you will probably ask me this later, we could also talk about the, the effects it has uh, because um, that has been even more controversial, controversial than the definition. Uh, but I guess, uh, yeah, maybe let's leave that for, for later. Yeah, because I, I mean, I hear many people who are not necessarily activists associating the term neoliberalism with stuff like market deregulation, privatization, uh, the degradation of workers' rights, the minimum wage, and uh, also, uh, I mean, basically restructuring the system to favor wealth concentration among the elites and the degradation of uh, job uh, conditions and stuff like that. I mean, the term precariousness comes up a lot about the precariousness of jobs and all of that, the, the gig economy, for example. So, I mean, can we still, uh, from an economics perspective, take something useful from that? Or not? Yeah, yeah, sure, we definitely can. Um, now, I would be careful here to try and define neoliberalism in normatively, morally neutral ways. I would just say, like you did, that neoliberalism is an attempt at uh, deregulating the economy, at privatizing. Maybe uh, the deregulations that we talk about are also involve uh, precarization of labor the, um, and, and maybe uh, they impact the trade unions. But I would just say neoliberalism are certain institutions or certain reforms and then what their outcome is. Do they actually undermine the bargaining position of labor? Do they actually negatively influence mm -hmm. the living standards? Now, that is a separate empirical question. Uh, and what we find in the literature is that, um, again, it's a mixed bag. So one of the most famous, most used uh, empirical operationalizations of neoliberalism is to use the various uh, indexes of economic freedom that are developed by usually libertarian leaning um, uh, institutions like the Fraser Institute or Heritage Foundation. But um, the Fraser Institute uses uh, third party data to construct the uh, index. So I don't think that there's any bias in the construction or the data that they use of the index. And um, these indexes usually involve five dimensions. Uh, first of all, the size of government, and they classify each country for every e year uh, on, on all of those uh, five dimensions, where, whether it's more economically unfree or more economically free, or maybe, Ricardo, for our purposes, uh, more neoliberal. So um, one dimension is the size of government. This means that if you have a high amount of taxation, loads of social transfers, and all the rest of it, then you're not neoliberal, you're not economically free. According to this index, you get a low score. Uh, and then you have things like um, property rights, 
the legal system, um, freedom of international trade, the amount of regulation and sound money, and all of those other dimensions are also scored on, on a scale from zero to 10. And the more neoliberal you are, the higher the score is. And then we can look at correlations. We can look at um, whether the more neoliberal, according to this index, the more neoliberal countries have all other sorts of problems that usually activists and some scholars associate uh, the term with. And what we find is that, uh, like I said, it's a mixed bag. So when it comes to economic growth and the growth of income, even income across the distribution, so the bottom of the society, the middle of the society and the top of the society, Increases in economic freedom tend to be associated in cross-cultural, uh, cross-country uh, studies uh, with the higher rates of economic growth and uh, growth of income. The majority of studies shows this. There was a recent systematic review released by the Fraser Institute, which went over, I think, 700 uh, quantitative studies using the economic freedom index, and they found that when it comes to economic growth and income growth. Uh, the majority, 60 to 70 percent of these studies uh, find a positive association. When it comes to inequality, it's more mixed. The majority of papers finds a null result or mixed findings. That means that increases in economic freedom or high levels of economic freedom sometimes have a le are associated with higher levels of inequality, sometimes not, sometimes nothing happens, but it's much more mixed. So I would be careful there. Something similar goes for the environment and the environmental protection and for uh, labor rights. Labor rights, it seems that economic freedom can, can uh, negatively impact them. Uh, so then it's just, like I said, it's an empir empirical question. I don't think we should bring any uh, emotions in it and just try to dispassionately look at the data. I go through the data in my book. There's also a critique by, by certain Marxist scholars. They say we shouldn't use these economic indexes because they're um, constructed in a way that hides how, how capitalist or neoliberal a society actually is because it just looks at, at, the, um, uh, at the rule of law or um, a corruption. And if there is a high degree of uh, rule of law or a low degree of corruption, it gets scored as a highly neoliberal country. I respond to all of that in the book. Um, there is something to that critique, but not as much as the critics think. So, uh, taking one step further, and of course this is not something new, I've talked, for example, with Jerry Mueller, who has a great book on the intellectual history of capitalism and how people from different ideologies reacted to the rise of capitalism and how they condemned it morally, socially, uh, religiously, etc. So, when it comes to the morals of the market, and when I asked you my first question about neoliberalism, you mentioned that some people associated with, for example, individualism and that some sort of moral condemnation in a sense, people tend to, uh, or many people, associate markets with negative social behaviors and attitudes like increased aggressiveness, selfishness, corruption, mistrust, lack of empathy, and all of that. Are these claims supported by the scientific evidence or not? Yeah, surprisingly, mostly not. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two mindsets here, like you just uh, said. So the Marxist critique usually is uh, one of alienation, uh, of increased selfishness, aggressiveness, and, and moral bankruptcy of the modern economy. And then on the other hand, you have Enlightenment thinkers like Condorcet and Thomas Paine and others who uh, were in favor of a, a thesis they called the du commerce thesis, the, the gentle commerce thesis. And they said that modernity, capitalism, markets, exchange, that would actually nourish the human soul and would make it better, not worse. And uh, like I, I said initially, um, I think that the second thesis, the second mindset is closer to the truth than the first, the, the critical Marxist thesis. Uh, we have various uh, studies here. Uh, Joe Henrik, which you already mentioned and whom uh, we uh, talked about, has done many studies looking at how uh, market integration, uh, when a society is highly integrated in the market or completely subs self-subsistent and everything in, the, in between, uh, how that relates to cooperation and giving and altruism, 
stuff like the pro-sociality. And what he and his, re his team of researchers show is that both in the de developed world, just looking at differences between countries and their market integration in the developed world, or looking only at um, hunter-gatherer societies, some of uh, which are not integrated in the market and some of which are integrated in the market, and then comparing uh, all of that together, so making various different uh, comparisons, various different samples, basically, we usually see that more market integration is associated with more cooperation, with less selfishness, with more pro-sociality, even controlling for religion, for sex, for inequality, for the total amount of um, wealth in a society. So it's not wealth that is driving that, it's simply market integration, constantly meeting uh, strangers, constantly having beneficial positive sum exchanges on the market with people that you don't know. That builds social, social trust. That increases your proclivity to engage in cooperations. Uh, cooperation, it seems so. Um, and then when it comes to what, uh, let's say, discrimination and tolerance, again, if you look at um, the uh, indexes of economic freedom and try to see what happens when a society either becomes more economically free or if you just look at the level of economic freedom, so compare the more free with the less free societies, you usually see that there is more tolerance for homosexuality, for communists, for uh, various ideologies than in other societies that are less capitalistic, less market oriented, less economically free. Um, you also see that, uh, you mentioned aggressiveness, you see that um, civil wars, uh, coup d'etats, interstate wars, uh, homicides, all of that is usually um, more contained in societies that uh, trade with each, with, with each other, that are highly market integrated, that are wealthy, that are economically free. Not all of that. I mean, homicides, I think, are uh, a mixed bag. Maybe it's, it, I think it's a neutral association. The correlation between high levels of economic freedom and homicide rates, there, there's no association. And I think even one subsection of economic freedom, if you just look at size of government, the more neoliberal a country is, so the, the lesser, the, the, the smaller the government is, um, there is, there seems to be a boost in homicide rates. So you have mixed um, findings even here, but Ricardo, overall, I think the Marxists are, are more wrong than not here. Mm -hmm. So one last topic then, and this is another complicated one. So about the climate and climate change. So there are people out there uh, many activists, again, that blame capitalism for climate change. They say that climate change is uh, caused or was caused by capitalism and it's worsened by capitalistic activity, let's say, or capitalist activity. So uh, is that true or not? Yeah, I would say it is. I would say it is. There are some nuances here as well, but uh, overall, yeah, I think that's true. So to the extent that capitalism ignites economic growth, and I argued in the beginning of our interview that it does so, to that extent, uh, it definitely causes climate change because increased economic growth means more consumption of energy and uh, more consumption of energy usually comes from, at least it did come in the past, from fossil fuels which release emissions into the air pollutants and that warms the planet and uh, warming of the planet is the main issue that we worry about uh, when it comes to climate change because it has many knock-on effects and various uh, consequences that then more than the warming itself uh, are, are um, in our interest to, to discuss. Um, so it does, it does. Now, we have to be careful, though, because various non-capitalist societies like the Soviet Union, which was a centrally planned economy with um, not much markets, uh, also were quite polluting and contributed to warming of the planet uh, because they also grew only for a few decades. Uh, so Self-sustaining growth for many decades and centuries only comes from capitalism, but they were able to grow at a large human cost uh, through forced industrialization in the Soviet Union for a few decades. And um, to the extent that they grew, they also used more fossil fuels and they also, uh, comparably to the United States on a per capita uh, basis, and if you compare uh, comparable levels of economic development, they uh, destroy the environment in many ways, especially by contributing to warming of the, of the planet. Uh, now, the uh, activists, the critics of capitalism are also correct that mm, markets sometimes engender market failures. So markets sometimes um, contribute to the overproduction of negative externalities like pollution because 
um, the costs of pollution are not spontaneously, naturally, um, they don't naturally emerge on the market. When two parties uh, make an exchange and they release some uh, emissions in the air, those emissions then hurt other parties as well that were not um, party to the exchange, and so they cannot assert their costs. Uh, in, in the exchange. So in that sense, uh, people in capitalism definitely are incentivized by the market to over pollute. Uh, this can be of course, um, uh, this can be of course held in check by the action of the government. For example, you have carbon uh, pricing or carbon taxation and you can, uh, uh, through the mechanism of the government, you can uh, internalize the otherwise externalized negative costs associated with uh, polluting activity, production and exchange. So again, this is a nuance. Spontaneously, capitalism will definitely incentivize us to over pollute, but this can be held in check, just like inequalities, this can be held in check by the action of the government. And on the other hand, even if capitalism might be a cause of climate change or even the main cause, mm -hmm. uh, there are people like, again, Steven Pinker, for example, who in his book Enlightenment Now argues for a perspective where economic development might also contribute to easing climate change or its effects. And he talks, for example, about uh, increasing technological development. So uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, it's a, it's a seeming paradox, but you're right, you're right. It can also do that. There are a few mechanisms to do that, but maybe let's first take a step back and define a few terms. Um, okay. Because capitalism is so efficient, it usually engenders what is called relative decoupling. Relative decoupling happens when you have an increase in economic growth and also an increase, a concomitant increase in the use of resources, materials, and of course the release of emissions. But the, the second increase of all of these bad things is lesser. The rate of growth is lesser than the rate of growth of the economy. So uh, over the long term, they diverge. Economies are growing more and more, and the um, uh, use of resources and emissions also grow, but at a, a slower pace. And capitalism is constantly doing that because it is so efficient, because it is incentivizing for the sake of the profit motive, um, the economic actors not to um, waste their materials, not to use too much if they don't need uh, for a given amount of output. Uh, but that is not enough to hold in check um, climate change. What you need is absolute decoupling. Absolute decoupling is, is uh, this happens when the economy grows, but the, um, incre but the use of resources and emissions actually declines year on year. And this is what is needed. And this is happening to a certain extent in the developed world, especially the decoupling, absolute decoupling of emissions from economic growth is happening and has been happening for now around 30 to 20 years. And we also see uh, inklings of absolute decoupling when it comes to material resource use, but again, just in developed uh, countries. And this also holds if we control for outsourcing. Sometimes critics sa say that, of course, you see decoupling because everything is produced in China. Uh, but no, even if you control for that, you still see decoupling in the developed world. It's just not fast enough. Currently, it's not fast enough. We have to increase absolute decoupling. But what does uh, capitalism have to do with that? Well, like you said, one mechanism is simply that capitalism is such a technologically dy um, dynamic society. Everybody is incentivized to constantly innovate, to create new um, technologies. That means that the prospects of inventing a negative emissions technology that would help us extract uh, CO2 and other pollutants from the air becomes more possible. It's still not on the books right now, but it's more likely because of how technologically um, dynamic capitalism is. More importantly, because it is so technologically dynamic, you, can, you see that costs of um, renewable energy are plummeting in the past 15 years. So renewable energy like solar and wind, without, which doesn't have um, uh, negative emissions or um, the, the amount is minuscule, um, those sources of renewable energy existed for a long time. But only in the past 10 to 15 years have there been enough market innovations and, and of course government regulations and government uh, research and development. Uh, market capitalism was working in um, joint venture with the government uh, that we see now these renewable energy sources being um, uh, competitive, cost competitive with fossil fuels. So it, now it has become, due to the combination of the market and the government, it has become uh, profitable for capitalists uh, to use renewable energy 
in production. We don't need to rely on their moral sensibilities, um, so th th and they would still do that. And then lastly, economic development, which you mentioned, the general increase in wealth, means that um, the attitudes and beliefs of people start changing. When people have enough to eat, when their material living standards are rising, when they get political and civil rights, which is all of that is associated, as I show in the book, with capitalism and economic development, when they become well off, they can also start thinking. They're both, they have the time and the energy to start thinking about um, saving the environment and pressing the, uh, the government through protests and, and other activities like that to put in place the necessary regulations. So in that sense, economic development can also paradoxically at first increase pollution, but then after a certain threshold is reached, can start decreasing it. This is called the environmental Kuznets curve. And they also talk about uh, more empirically uh, uh, about that in the book. Mm -hmm. So I have just one last observation to make uh, about the book and about our conversation today. And, uh, as, uh, and I would like to ask you to please comment on it or at least to say if it's right or wrong if I'm making a correct observation about what you wrote about here. So, uh, and I think that's why the book is titled Capitalism for Realists, because, I mean, if we divide people into two groups, on the one hand, for example, the socialists, the communists, the Marxists, and on the other hand, the uh, economical liberals, the, liber the libertarians and the capitalists, I mean, uh, both of them get a few things right uh, on the one hand, the vices of capitalism, and on the other hand, the virtues of capitalism. I mean, it's not that they're completely wrong about everything they claim about the vices and virtues of capitalism. But I mean, the, but the extreme views that some people have that uh, capitalism is a perfect system and or is the best possible system out there and no one can question it or on the other hand that it's the worst possible <laughs> system ever and it only has vices and no virtues i mean but as in all science and particularly social science i guess that those are just silly uh, positions to have from a scientific perspective because it's very rarely the case if ever mm -hmm. that uh, something is uh, all good or all bad and has just positive or negative effects or consequences. So is that a correct observation Absolutely. of what you, you're trying to expose there in the book or not? This was better said than if I said it, Ricardo. This is spot on. And um, I should mention that, of course, I think some of my Marxist friends will chastise me and will say, but, but why didn't you tell him that actually Marx himself was divided on capitalism? Marx himself said that um, capitalism is a very productive system. In the Communist Manifesto, he did toy with the idea that Marxism, uh, that uh, capitalism will increase absolute poverty, which is a crazy idea. But after that, he, uh, he didn't return to that idea. And he just said that um, capitalism will increase inequalities, but uh, absolute living standards for everybody will increase. So my Marxist friends will say, uh, why didn't you tell him that libertarians are the ones who are, are deluded, but Marxists have, actually have a, a, a balanced view of capitalism? Now, I would say to that that, no, like you said, Marxists definitely do overplay the vices of capitalism and understate the um, uh, virtues of capitalism. They do mention both of them, but they overstate one and underplay uh, the other. And also, my Marxist friends would probably be surprised when, le when reading public choice theory, when reading smart libertarians like uh, Matt Zulinski or Jason Brennan um, or, or people like that, they would be surprised that they themselves also, libertarians also mention both vices and virtues. They tend to overplay the virtues and underplay the vices, uh, but definitely both of them do that. So um, yeah, Ricardo, I would leave it at that. That was a perfect summary uh, of the book. Thanks for that. Okay, great. So again, the title of the book is Capitalism for Realists, Virtues and Vices of the Modern Economy. I will be leaving a link to it in the description box of the interview. And by the way, apart from the book, where can people find you and your work on the internet? Yeah, um, I don't have any specific website, uh, but um, they can definitely find me on ResearchGate. Just type in Tibor Rutar and they'll find all of my publications there, most of them available to read.
um, they can also you know, they can also look me up on Google Scholar. Uh, there are all the links to my work are there. Um, so that would basically be it for now. Okay, great. So, Dr. Ruter, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It was an amazing conversation. I really loved it and I really loved the book. So I recommend it to everyone out there listening or watching this interview. And uh, it was a real pleasure to talk to you. That's so kind, Ricardo. Thanks. Thanks. And the questions were awesome as they usually, usually are on your show. And maybe we get the opportunity to talk again uh, sometimes in the future. Sure. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to keep the channel sustainable, please consider supporting it on Patreon or PayPal. The links are in the description box of this interview. And if you like this interview, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check the website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzkan, Blanchett Perga, Larson, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernard Seixas, Herbert Gintis, Olaf, Alex, Jonathan Visser, Adam Kessel, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Cavanagh, George Pinha, Michael Stormier, Samuel Andrea, Francis Ford, Tiago Nunes, Alexander Dan Bauer, Fergal Cusson, Harl Herzog, Nun Machado, Jonathan Leibrandt, John Nier, Stanton, T. Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, John Weira, Tom Hummel, Sardis France, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez, Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Puntara, Dan Arzmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pablo Stazewski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, Simon Fzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, John Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Doug, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzka, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wisman, Morton Eichland, Dr. Bird, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Mau Maria, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Lowacki, Georgios Steofanis, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Ruth Towell, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Murray, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Pedro Bonilla, Ziegler, João Barbosa, Bangalore Atheists, Larry D. Lee Jr., Old Herrigman, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Gracies, Tom Roth, D. RPMD and Eager N. And special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafinia, Tom Venegdam, Bernard Ugni, Curtis Dixon, Belnick Miller, Vega Giddy, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Robert Lewis and Alni Cortiz, and to my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.